uh, region you to discuss how uh, your films began, sort of the genesis uh, for each of the projects. So, very counterclockwise. Okay. Um, I mean, see, I, I grew up in uh, in the town I, I made the movie in, uh, which is New Hall, uh, or Canyon Country, California. And um, I guess, like, I kind of grew up skating my whole life, and, um, and like, there's all these abandoned homes, and uh, we used to kind of break into these homes and either like build half pipes or like, um, you know, do different things like that. And I wanted to kind of tell a similar story about kids doing the same thing. And so, um, you see, I, I met these uh, these two best friends at the skate park, and I'm just really interested in people that can, like, who are just themselves all the time, like, which is, I feel like is really difficult, but it's like, um, like when I met them, like they didn't really care. I was listening to them, and like they were just 100% themselves. And, uh, and I guess that's where we started. Um, um, my producer got uh, married to a Slovakian uh, dancer, professional dancer, in within this environment, and we attended her the farewell show, and we were like about how people were crying and they were all upset about this and because we never really heard about it, never really had seen anything of that kind of dancing and we thought that that whole secluded environment we had awaiting there and, and um, just the whole thing of, we, we, of course we knew it as, as all of you guys do um, from the, the TV shows Quickly Come Dancing and stuff like that and, and we thought that, that the whole um, the whole thing about portraying love on, on a very glittered and very romantic way is, was interesting to see among these couples who are, are married and, and, and dance professionally together as well. So they are, they are like, they're together 24 hours a day and of course the love life isn't as, as romantic as it is on the floor, so, yeah. Um, our film started out as a kind of uh, broad, uh, survey of reality performance and kind of like how people uh, internalize their own persona and perform it out back at the world through like social media platforms or reality TV and so as we were doing research for the film we came across Chris and we uh, ended up interviewing him for the film and he just is so captivating and really uh, his media is so interesting that he just kind of took our focus entirely, and so our documentary ended up being entirely about him and his story as a way of getting at these kind of broader themes we were looking to explore. Um, I'm a photographer, and I was photographing Donatella Versace for Elle, and I went to a party that she had in Beverly Hills, and Jackie, the Queen of Versailles, was one of her best customers at the time. And I took a picture of Jackie and her two girlfriends purses. And the picture ended up in time, pictures of the year, and Jackie and I stayed in touch. And um, at some point, I guess the, maybe that first night, I heard she was building the biggest house in America, but I didn't really believe it. But then we followed up with her, and it turned out she was. And um, I've been working on a project, a, a book project about wealth for many years. And so I went to photograph her for that project. And the first time I went there, she invited me to stay with her. And there was something really interesting about Jackie and her family because um, they didn't have the kind of protective veil that money often brings and were so kind of open and unpretentious. And I think because they both come from very humble origins and that part they kept, they had this kind of interesting kind of American dream story where they were like, could go seamlessly between Versace and Walmart and caviar and McDonald's and um, embodied a lot of things I was interested in. So then we just started making the film and that was during the boom and then um, the economic crisis really affected the timeshare business, which was David's business and then that kind of turned the film. Right, why do you think they uh, lack that kind of self-consciousness, that kind of protective skin? Um, uh, I think that they both, ha I think David has a lot of confidence and in his world, it's not like Hollywood or Beverly Hills. They don't, they don't need handlers and people that kind of, um, they're, they're kind of themselves. And I think he was so on top of the world that he could just be himself without worrying about anything. And then Jackie, I think it's just who she is. She's just, she doesn't care what anybody thinks. She doesn't like, 
she likes things, but it's not about keeping up with the Joneses. It's just kind of her fantasy world. She just is like, she just does what she does. Right, right. Um, and then Valerie, I uh, was thinking, you know, Chris is a fascinating uh, figure in a lot of different ways. Uh, on one level, he's sort of a bit of sort of a Warholian uh, sort of figure, you know, sort of this very self-created, you know, sort of genre or gender, you know, sort of smashing figure. Um, but he's also, in, in a lot of ways, sort of a creature of social media. Do you think he could have existed or do you think he could have had the same kind of cultural um, impact? Uh, if he was living any other age uh, than the one that we're currently in. I mean, we've my co-director, Chris McCarble, and I have talked about that a number of times. What would our character be like without social media? And, you know, on one level, we kind of have this, like, fantasy that maybe he would have, like, moved to New York and, you know, become this kind of, like, outsider character or whatever. But in a lot of ways, I feel like without the outlet of social media and also without the mirror of social media, he wouldn't have formed the same persona and it would be a much different like you know character that we were dealing with so I think a lot of his um, especially a lot of his like uh, gender kind of performance really uh, found a, a fertile ground in like the social media space right and he's also a very interesting figure where on one hand he's very extroverted you know and he's very out there um, but you know there's also an, an incredible vulnerability uh, to him um, and uh, you know um, I think he, he dropped out of high school at, at, at 14, you know, yeah, due, due to he, this, uh, um, you know, um, and on what level do you think um, sort of dealing with this sort of incredibly vicious homophobia uh, that in a lot of ways it seemed like kind of defined sort of the contours of his life, definitely in the small town, on what level do you think that kind of prepared him uh, for dealing with, I guess, the tidal wave of homophobia that kind of greeted him when he became uh, the sort of national figure? Yeah, I mean, he's talked about how the the kind of bullying in his hometown and then also just the ostracization of uh, him from his peers early on really did prepare him for uh, kind of confronting a lot of like hatred and bigotry on the internet, for sure. I think he is the kind of person who's never really felt uh, that sense of social belonging, so it didn't feel that strange to him to have that much hate hurled at him on the internet. Right, right. And, and interesting, it seems like a lot of his life is sort of this very solo performance. Um, you know, that, uh, that that's kind of a way to kind of have the world be sort of a mirror that just kind of reflects uh, him back to himself. Mm -hmm. And you have, you know, this technique in, in the film where you see, you know, sort of this, this funhouse mirror of, of Chris's where, um, you know, uh, he... Uh, performs, and then you see all these other people performing these very distorted kind of figures of him. Was that always kind of a big part of it? Um, this idea that you know you see Chris filtered through himself, but then also through you know a million other distorted mirrors. I mean, that was a really exciting discovery of like the archival process of the project, like realizing how many kids reperform him. It's it's actually amazing. Like you know, there's he'll make a video, and then maybe like. 30 kids will make a response video of his video. And his video is coming from like the weirdest place. Like who knows what he was thinking when he makes a video like screaming in the kitchen. And then all of a sudden there's like 20 kids screaming in the kitchen. So, you know, I, I think that it's an indication of a style of entertainment that's becoming more popular and is, and is really interesting. And it's kind of, a, I think it's very specific to our time in the internet because it's, taking culture that already exists and reappropriating it and remashing it and putting it back out. And that's kind of a new thing, I think, or especially for like popular culture. Right, and there's another interesting sort of a permutation to that where part of it is him going to Los Angeles uh, to film, I guess it'd be a pilot uh, yes. for, for a reality show. Yeah. And one level it almost seems like, well, that's redundant because he's already living inside this reality show, um, you know, but it's sort of the I guess one of the benefits of that is that he's able to kind of control it um, and that he's able to be sort of the auteur of how he's perceived, you know, which again is, is, is kind of problematic because, you know, on YouTube, obviously it's not just this, you know, one person throwing something out, it's, it's this dialogue in the most toxic, horrible way imaginable. Um, and I know 
people on YouTube are terrible. Um, and to what level do you think he kind of let that affect him? On what level do, did he develop thicker skin? Because uh, you know, on one level, I mean, just to survive, uh, coming from the world that he came from, I, like I, I definitely uh, came away from it with a sort of a newfound uh, respect. Um, even just you know the mere act of surviving in that context mm -hmm. um, and being yourself and being unapologetic um, seems like, heroic. I mean, did, did you see that? You know, that there was an element of, of heroism to what he did totally. just in being himself. He really identifies a lot with divas, particularly like Mariah Carey and like Whitney Houston and Britney Spears. And I think that what he identifies in these figures is a kind of empowered, self-contained uh, female energy that is confident and doesn't care. And I think his, again, his lack of like social uh, fabric kind of create, perpetuates the sense of isolation for him. And so I think in some ways, like the hatred on the internet really, again, doesn't really super affect him so much because of his kind of cultivated persona. And it is a, it's a shell, you know? Right, to, right that the world bounces off of, I guess. Yeah, um, do you uh, see the uh, reality show Chaotic? Yes. Uh, Brittany Kemp, because I, you know, I, I watched that, oh, so my good. God, it's so morbidly, morbidly fascinating. There are like four, five episodes of uh, it. Yeah, five episodes. Um, and, and it basically, for those of you who aren't familiar with uh, Brittany and Kevin, Chaotic. Uh, it was a, a five-part uh, reality show on the UPN. Uh, uh, Yes, and it was it was dedicated to chronicling the heroic romance between Kevin Federline uh, and Britney Spears, and it's sort of talking about sort of uh, gender roles um, there. And one of the things that's kind of fascinating about this is that uh, Kevin Federline very much emerges as the object of desire, uh, and the idea that she's very very lucky that she gets to be with this person who's like this mysterious figure. Um, and one of the other things that's kind of interesting about uh, Brittany and Kevin, chaotic, um, is that it, it kind of plays like Chris. You know, it's kind of them putting the camera on themselves, uh, sort of turning themselves into this, this piece of art. And one of the things that really struck me about it, I watched it after I saw your film, oh, cool. is that uh, they, they do a much worse job of it uh, than Chris does. And uh, here, this woman is one of the most successful entertainers in the world. And she's doing a much, much, much more worse uh, job of presenting herself on camera, of defining herself, than you know this this teenager who comes from this incredibly poverty-ridden, um, you know, uh, sort of rural background. Um, the chaotic is made up ex almost exclusively of footage that Britney shot herself on right. her little camera, Britney and there's and a there's a scene in, from Chaotic that we didn't put in our film that um, you know I wish we did, uh, where she is turning on this little camera and she's like, I'm really lonely, I'm on tour, I don't have anyone around me, I, like, I've just turned to this little camera and, you know, and then, she's, and then she starts to film her hotel suite as if she's kind of like on MTV Cribs or something. Right, she right. sort of adopts this like basketball player attitude and she's like, this is my, you know, kitchen and this is my like whatever. So throughout like the whole, I mean it's interesting about this, but throughout Chaotic, the reality series, Britney is kind of like internalizing like uh, the, the reality medium and kind of re-representing right, right. her own life that way. It's a super interesting show to like kind of watch closely. I would love to see like the original footage, you know, uncut from that whole time period. Oh, totally. And there's, God, and like, um, well, they actually have some of the like deleted footage on the DVD. Um, and some of it's just absolutely horrifying. Uh, like there's a sequence where she seems pretty clearly on, on drugs um, and is talking about her desire to see the movie Spun. Um, and it's just like six minutes of utter, utter, utter madness. And, and it, it was a huge meme. It was a viral right, sensation. Right. That totally. Video. And it's like, if I were these people, I would do anything to keep this footage from ever coming out to the public. But to present yourself in that way, and for that to be how you want the world to see you on some level, I, I think is absolutely fascinating. And speaks to you know the sort of profound disconnect. I think someone on her team didn't quite get the memo about like small digital technologies, and so she was kind of allowed to have this camera for like maybe five months and filmed all this like strange, crazy shit. And some of it's ended up on the internet, you know. Right. And I, now you you know her team is it's highly filtered. You would never see a video now of, of Britney just filming herself. So it was a really unique moment and I think she it was it was before she moved to LA and stopped making music for a while and, right, and right. then spiraled so I think it, part of the attitude of her, her filming herself was this kind of rebellious I'm gonna film myself I'm gonna harass my bouncers I'm gonna like do my own thing right right and there's this kind of heartbreaking moment in the film where uh, 
I guess Brittany kind of comes down against uh, Chris, uh, which again had to be just absolutely shattering for somebody who has devoted so much of their life and for whom derives so much of their identity from being a Britney Spears fan. Uh, but do you know? Uh, have you heard anything of how you know Britney? If she's seen the film, uh, or if she has any kind of kind of response to that? The only thing I know is there was. Um... I'm actually surprised she's not here. <laughs> because I, no, she, she tries to hit up all the I major know. documentary film festivals. Like Columbia, Missouri, yeah. Brittany. Um, what was your question again? Oh, you were saying, did she see it? Oh, she, the only thing I know is that a Swedish journalist posted online that he was uh, given a list of questions not to ask Brittany, and the first thing on the list was not to ask her about Chris Crocker. Right, so, right. I don't, I don't know, really. I, I, well, well, why do you think that is? Why do you think she has... <laughs> taken this, the stand against this, this incredibly vulnerable young man. I think it's her team. I think it's right. a brand issue. I think that it, it's just he represents a time when she, she was, you know, not uh, behaving according to, like, the pop star way. And I think that it's just messy. And, you know, I'm sure her team will come around. I'm sure, like, they'll support the film eventually, you know. But we're not really pushing it because... It's ultimately like about something else than Britney anyways, you know? Right, right. So sort of continuing on the, the theme of how people sort of perceive themselves uh, and how they internalized ideas of uh, the cultures around them. Um, in, in your film, uh, the, the girls, uh, again, are very, very headstrong uh, and very, I mean, I feel like in a lot of ways they're kind of the protagonists, you know, and they're kind of the heroes and they're the strong-willed people. But at the same time, there's this expectation that within their church, uh, within the culture, um, that they are expected to be submissive. Um, and at one point, it seems like uh, Garrison breaks up with his girlfriend yeah. because the elders, of, the elders of the church basically say, you know, <coughs> she's too sassy. <laughs> you know, she's too manic. She's, too, she's got too much spirit and spunk. And it's just, again, this kind of heartbreaking moment where it kind of seems like that's who they are on a fundamental level. <laughs> you know, on what level do you think the, the girls in, in your film uh, internalize these sort of ideas about... Um, having to be submissive and having to, you know, sort of uh, play the, this very kind of pre, pre-existing role. Um, let me see. I mean, I, I think, I mean, first of all, like, I, I don't think we really would have had a movie without uh, these two girls in the film. Um, one of them is just, it's strange because I've never met, like, a teenager who's just extremely conservative, like, or have, you know, had, like, any political views, like, it... And like, she she's just so firm with how she stands, and um, and that that was really impressive to me. And I think the the other girl, Kristen, like she she was kind of more questioning. I think the church and if this is what she really wanted, and um, and I I think I think that was it was kind of great of her to ask questions. But I think like people like. Uh, adults that really wanted her to, you know, just follow them along, like, didn't really like her, you know, being this way. And so um, they they wanted to get her out of the church. So, like, we actually, we, it was frustrating because we couldn't film this. Like, they wouldn't let us in the church, and they wouldn't let us film any part of it. And really, I mean, we didn't want to make a, a film on Christianity. Like, it was kind of more so something that... Um, uh, that that was uh, that was a part of their lives, and we didn't really want to make a statement either way. It's like it, I don't know. Like, I, and I don't think it's a huge part of their life either. And that's why I think these people were so frustrated and wanted them to break up because it's tough. I don't know who's seen my movie, so I'm like, I don't know if this is making any sense. But no, um, it is. Uh, but it, yeah, I, I guess. Um, I guess like these two girls had very different views on Christianity and how they wanted it in their lives, and, uh, and that was really impressive to me. And we wanted to film, I think, both sides of that. Um, right. Um, and, and to what extent? Uh, again, I feel like a lot of these characters are, are sort of uh, seeming contradictions, and that they're sort of these uh, rebellious punk rock, uh, you know, uh, conservative Christians. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, do they see that as, as a contradiction? And what, and what is the appeal of, of punk rock? Uh, when you're prostrating yourself before Jesus and you're doing what, what you know your elders tell you what to do yeah um, I, I mean I didn't I didn't really understand like why they you know they loved bands like crass and like minor threat and I mean uh, I mean I think they're they're trying to find some way to rebel you know like any teenager and 
um, I don't know. I I can't tell you like how they got into this stuff. It's, right, it's right. actually like, and I don't think they know either. But I I like I love that they're out trying to, you know, figure this stuff out. And I think, you know, I think this music kind of gives them. I mean, because they don't play sports and, like. They're kind of, I mean, these two boys, like all they have is each other and it's it's really beautiful. Like they're like, I don't know, like, like I'm scared for the day, like, and which in the end of our, our movie, like they kind of have to go different ways, which like now it's like, I mean, we're still friends and we like, they're texting me, asking me how the festival's going. And like, uh, and like, we didn't really want them to come like, because we want them to continue their life and like, you know, not kind of be bothered with this, but um, uh, sorry, I had a point. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just uh, interesting because again, it seems like they're trying to uh, rebel and conform yeah. at the exact same time. And yeah. then, again, and there are all these contradictions where you look at them and yeah. you see their energy, you know, and you see their you know guilelessness and they're just sort of lust for life, and then you think that like, but at the same time, they're very concerned with doing exactly what people expect of them yeah. uh, and kind of exactly what they feel like society is, is pretty much ordering them to do. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I, yeah, I guess like one, one of the kids is moving away. And so um, I guess, yeah, like the end of our film, you're kind of seeing like how they're like preparing, I guess, for like his best friend, like he's known his whole life. He's going to leave. And, um, and, and, yeah, I, I guess it, it's kind of this like strange time for them because like they didn't have to make other friends and they, they just had each other and um, and yeah, I don't know. I, I, yeah, I'm curious. I, I want to keep filming, but uh, I feel like we kind of ended it a right spot, I feel like, and you could kind of imagine the rest or, you know, figure things out, but yeah. Right, right. And then um, uh, Lauren, um, play in your film is, is very interesting. And to what extent do you feel like Jackie kind of defines herself um, through the, uh, you know, being a wife and a mother? And especially, uh, not only that, but sort of, uh, I guess one of her children refers to her as, as a trophy wife. Mm -hmm. um, and again, um, she comes from a very interesting background, is it an engineering degree? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, yeah, I, on what level do you think she lets us kind of define her? On what level do you think um, her husband's perception of her? sort of uh, defines who right. she is and how she kind of sees herself in, in this very specific kind of cultural milieu. Right, well to give it a little context, I mean a lot of my work is especially, well not just relating to gender, but in general is kind of about pushing into kind of the stereotypes and right. kind of the icons of popular culture and then kind of breaking through them to show the reality. So in a way, um, just as a kind of metaphor in my photography a lot of times the colors are very rich and saturated and the surfaces of the pictures are very glossy and um, there's a kind of even in the this was my first book a kind of we remember we were joking about using TNA to sell the book right and um, and then kind of puncturing through that and um, um, I guess the best example of that was when I, sh I showed girl culture at a museum and there was this big picture of a woman in lingerie pulling off her bra for the photographer and kind of being very sexy and it was at a university museum and a jock came in and said to the docent, oh yeah, I'm gonna really love this show. <laughs> and the girl culture work was really about kind of how the body has become the primary expression of identity for girls and women and kind of the exhibitionism of modern femininity. So then this jock went through the whole show and came out and said, hey, dude, I'm really sorry. I had no idea what it was about. And that's kind of, in a way, the journey that, um, that I often kind of go on in my work and that ended up have, happening with the Queen of Versailles because you start with this kind of Pamela Anderson, larger than life, physically, like, larger than life. Amazonian. Um, Amazonian kind of beauty and with all kinds of preconceptions like trophy wife, they're 30 years, she's 30 years her husband's junior, so did she marry him for the money? She's the beauty queen, he's the billionaire. And then what you find out is not only does she really love him and kind of need him for much, with much kind of deeper, uh, in deeper ways, but also, she's really smart, and right, right. she's an engineer. And in the edit, we ended up, I, I originally had 
her backstory and her being an engineer later in the film and ended up pushing it forward because knowing that she was an engineer and that she had graduated from RIT really changed the way you thought about her and also realized that these are really her choices and that she made this choice that's also really revealing of the culture where she could have been an engineer and decided that being in this office was not what she wanted and that she was going to kind of use her brains to have another life and basically decided to become a model and a beauty queen. And that was, I mean, that's a kind of really interesting choice for me in terms of the American dream and, you know, what, what you can kind of, kind of the currency that your body can be in our culture and, and also in terms of the values. And I, photogra I photographed, um, a couple years I was photographing at a brothel in Nevada and one of the girls I photographed was a college-educated social worker right, who had right. been making $400 a week and was like, no, I'm going to empower myself to make $10,000 a week. So I think that a lot of things with Jackie are, are not what they seem. Right. Um, and there's a really heartbreaking moment in the film, I don't want to give too much away, um, but where you ask uh, the husband, um, you know, does your relationship with Jackie uh, give you strength in, in your time of need? Um, and he says, no. Um, you know that in in a lot of ways it's like having another child. Uh, do you think that that's generally how he perceives her, or do you think that is again kind of this this very dark mental space that he kind of goes into? Well, it's funny because when you asked me to be on this panel, I was like, "What is the manic pixie dream girl, and what does it have to do with my film?" But in a way, now that you explain more about it, Jackie kind of is that manic pixie mm -hmm. dream girl because she is so full of life and in some ways is like a child because she has so much energy and she doesn't worry about things and she just has a lot of generosity and kind of a good heart and just brings that to every day. Um, and David is in a place where he is really, really stressed by his financial situation. And Jackie feels like, when, and he's a workaholic and just works all the time and kind of isolates as he goes into this crisis. And, Jackie never pushes him to talk about those things because she feels like when he comes home, that's her part of the bargain, is she gives him this oasis. And so I think he's saying she's like a child because they don't talk about those things. And that was the really kind of amazing thing that happened towards the end of the movie is I realized that David in these interviews, which almost became like confessionals and he was so candid, that he was telling me more than Jackie knew and sometimes and actually on the last shoot in our interview when David said that the Versailles house was in default Jackie was eavesdropping on the interview and that's how she found out that their dream uh, home was in foreclosure yeah and and you know again you're dealing with people who have a lot of money and a lot of power um, were there PR agencies that came in to it at all? I mean, were there people who, you know, would say like, you know, this doesn't really reflect wellness necessarily, or were they, you know, perhaps because they came from such a humble place as kind of without all of these filters and all these sort of barriers that people who have there kind no of wealth and Wow, and, and why, why do you think that it was? Um, I think it's just not the way they live, and I think I developed a relationship with Jackie that, you know, was kind of, um, allowed the access to open up and David um, I think at least in the beginning did it for Jackie right, the right. film and um, yeah that's just not how they they that's live that's not how they roll that's not how they roll okay so I guess now would be a good time to uh, open uh, it up uh, to the audience uh, if you guys have questions uh, please raise your hand okay yes Christian what is the name of your film again? Uh, Ballroom Dancer <laughs> Also laying on a secret screening gold uh, for, for the purposes of this, uh, this panel. Uh, so yeah, other, other questions from the, uh, from the audience? Yes. Well, one thing, secret screening gold, we're not supposed to use the Right, right. We're not supposed to be blocking the Oh, yeah. No, I know. I mean that to you. I just meant to anyone in the audience. Now that you know the title, you're actually not supposed to write about it, blog about it, tweet about it, you can just talk about it here. Awesome film, though. I like to see it. Do you think that your main character, who's the dancer, you know, he has a girlfriend who he also dances with. And so the subject here is gender roles. Do you think he really wanted her to be subservient to, I mean, do you think that was the issue, that she was strong and she had her own way? And, I mean, how do you think their, their, their gender roles played into their breakup? 
Um, well, the, the, the story is about Slavik, who is a former world champion, a uh, Russian world champion, and he finds this 10 year younger uh, girl. They're, they're together as a, a privately, and then they start dancing together as well. And uh, I think Slavik has this impression of himself. He regards himself as, a, as the king of dancing. Ah, and, and, yeah. yeah, and she's very, she is very uh, subversive, in, uh, um, um, uh, looks very much up to him li like a legend. So in the beginning, she's, the, he is very superior to her. At first. Yeah, yeah. And then it changes. What happens? And then it changes because I think he, tr he treats her so badly. He, she's just a tool for him to get to the top. And, and, um, and eventually she, she stands up against him and, and, do and doesn't want to be treated like that, any that anymore. So the, there is a kind of a, a, a women's lip story within the film, <laughs> um, but as, although Slavik is uh, the main character, and and um, but but she she develops amazingly throughout the story, and and is a very strong woman in the end. Right, uh, Christian, what uh, what what surprised you most uh, over the course of, of making this film? Um, I think. Um, I think maybe I think that this, the story of Slavic is um, how much you, you you like hook up your identity as uh, as a star. I mean, you he, he is, um, and I can see that after I made the film, I've, I've been talking to a lot of dancers who retire, and because they, they lived their whole life ever since they were kids, being stars and being totally devoted to what they do, that that it's. Um, it's almost that they look at, regard themselves as a, as a third person because they, and they're so afraid of what, what lies beneath all this fame and, and, um, and of the, the whole identity. That often people, when they, or dancers, when they retire, they get uh, addicts for a few years or alcoholics and because it's, it's, it's so hard for them to let go of that. Right, because it kind of defines them as, yeah, as people. Yeah, yeah totally. Yeah. Right. I mean, do you think that's the same for, for men and women or do you think like men or I, I, women have it easier? Especially men somehow. Right, I, right. Yeah, yeah, I don't know why that is, but, uh, but um, I think, that of course, a lot of, uh, the, 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 there may be a, a little macho, uh, Altruism um, linked to that, right? Although I guess also, you know, I guess women in, in a lot of ways, because of our culture, are, are more defined by the way they look mm. and by kind of their their physical presence. Yeah. Um, but you don't necessarily find that that they have a harder time dealing with, you know, sort of life after, uh, sort of this this, uh, this this stardom. No, it doesn't seem like that. But um, I, I don't know. I don't know much about about. I haven't really thought about that. But. Right. Right. All right, uh, yes. I'm sure Lauren and Mallory, I thought you could speak a little bit about, very interesting to me, uh, Jackie as a stereotypical dumb blonde, but you find that there's so much more to this story as there always is. And then uh, Chris almost becoming like a feminist icon in some way. You know, I'd just love to hear both you and anybody else talk about that a little bit. Do you want to start? So what, but what's your question? Um, just. Uh, what your thinking is, in particular, on um, women and stereotypes mm -hmm. and how it looks in popular culture is changing, clearly, and what your thinking is mm -hmm. and how it's changing. Um, hmm. I mean, I guess with regards to this film, I'm just always interested in the surprises, in a way, and I think um, things not being what they seem and kind of going to that place and then finding something else different. Um, and so I guess for me, that was kind of the journey that I went on with Jackie is, um, you know, is she smart? Is she aware? Like, in some ways she was like a co-director, like she really got the film. And I think she really enabled the access in a lot of places. And, um, and then, you know, sometimes she comes off like she's completely in her own world too. And so then this this contradiction, I mean, when I, when I went to RIT and met with her teacher and just like really had a sense of, what an unusual, how unusual it was then to be a woman in that engineering department. It really shifted, and also the relationship she had with her old friends, it just really shifted my perception of her. Um, but um, I don't know if that answers your question, okay. I love that you just said that Chris is a feminist icon, <laughs> like totally. So I think, you know, in, in throughout our film, he goes from being, you know, a flamboyant gay kid to 
uh, living as a transgendered woman in his small town in Tennessee for like two years and then making this kind of radical maneuver and like cutting his hair and becoming like very much a man character. And the subtext to all of that, which we touch on in the film, is I think his relationship with his mother. And she's, uh, she was 14 years old when she had him and she's like a small and blonde and like you want to talk about the mani- manic pixie dream girl that's her she's has no home and she has just kind of lives in the benevolence of her community and in the south with like an oppressive masculine energy it it she's very much abused and very much thrown around and it causes chris a lot of anxiety and so there's a scene in the film where he is fully dressed up in like trans makeup and hair and they're sitting in front of his video blog camera and he's trying to imbue her with this sense of power. He's like, you shouldn't let men hit you. You shouldn't like be picked on like this. And so he kind of created this like raging blonde, really strong female character, I think in a way to kind of be what he wanted his mom to be. And then um, for a lot of reasons, and, and, I'm, and I think as the years unfold, it will become clear why he really began to find a place of like solace and strength in like a, a, a masculine form. And I think that's a, a really interesting shift that I think is partly him becoming very comfortable with his own energy and his own self. And then also kind of he's has a trans nature. So he's, you know, neither female nor male and will never be either. And so he kind of enjoys playing with like cultural stereotypes. And in a way, I think that that transition back to like generating a really masculine persona is just so fascinating and I really wouldn't even want to put words in his mouth to describe like what that what that transitions about but I think that the blonde female character that he kind of plays is very much like a, a, a personifying a female strength that I think he would like to see around him right and to what extent do you feel like the hostility towards him is sort of uh, rooted in him transgressing pretty much all sort of these uh, gender boundaries and these you know boundaries of sexuality and just kind of he, he's a confusing figure and he's a, a very complicating figure and it seems like it, within that small town you know there are pretty finite ideas of how men act how women act how heterosexual people act. you know I think in, it's not just that town it's the internet and, right, and so right. I think that when he was younger he was very feminine and would like wear a little bit of eyeliner and like pose kind of you know, whatever on the internet. And I think people always kind of commented that he was very female and would sort of like tease him in that context. And so I think he started to own that a little bit. And then I think also like, you know, blonde female beauty was was, was sort of like what he liked to look at. And so he just started to look like that. And I, I think that the him him kind of bouncing around like that is very much a kind of like fuck you to like the world and i think it is you know more to the internet at large even than in his hometown because in his hometown he's so on the outside that nobody really is going to touch him now you know i think he found like a a real visible strength in being that different from everyone else right and again it's, it's it's kind of sad that i feel like the internet is in many many ways a very reactionary realm totally. and the idea that if you do anything kind of provocative if you do anything you yeah. know I, I feel like i can't write anything that's not horribly sexist without being like you're a strange dour feminist you know die motherfucker um and, and again I, I i think part of it you know is the anonymity of the internet and the yeah. fact that you know people don't have the accountability that they have otherwise and and somebody like chris who's putting himself out there who is you know being this kind of volcanic titanic force you know it kind of in you know engenders this sort of knee-jerk hostility between people who are not putting themselves out there to the point where like they don't have to say their name they don't have to say who they are they can just be these kind of phantoms yeah I mean, it's it's mm-hmm. definitely uh, an aspect of the internet. You know, it's interesting in our film, and we get into this a little bit, is whether or not you know you're like hating on Chris, or you're liking him, or you're like sharing his photo, or passing the link around because you find it like disgusting. He's making money. The corporations that are hosting his content are making money, and you know the internet wins whether or not the chatter is good or bad. And so it's almost like the the financial structure of the internet, or the way that the, the social media is monetized kind of just allows for this like kind of frothy chatter and you know it's interesting to all, see all, all talk is good talk yeah i've yeah. noticed that the i think the internet's getting less anonymous and i think people are being nicer i think it's facebook 
you know I think that it kind of like actually is sort of perpetuating this like p- false positivity sort of like right. I sort of feel like the age of like the mean nasty anonymous internet is like coming to an end I would like to think so yes oh okay <laughs> Yeah, I just had a quick question uh, for Lauren. Um, so uh, Jackie and David, when she saw the movie and she kind of saw that reaction of his um, at the end, I don't know, no, I don't get really, I don't get the sense of strength from her. But was that the reaction she was expecting, and did it at all um, kind of get her to reevaluate her role in the uh, kingdom? Um, you know, I think that's a good question, and I think it has to play out a little bit. She's only seen the movie once, and it was at the opening night at Sundance with like 1,400 people and it was like a lot of excitement. So she liked the movie. There were points where she got sad to more about losing Vegas than about the relationship. I mean, I think that in the relationship, nothing on the film really surprised her. She kind of lives that every day. So I think that she doesn't, I think we interpret it differently than she does. And I think that's what her daughter, Victoria, kind of calls out on her at the end. And, And Victoria kind of, you know, takes this surprising stand and gets upset at her dad and kind of criticizes that quality in their relationship where Jackie's kind of giving and he's just kind of going into his man cave. Um, so, um, so I don't know. I mean, I was definitely like the thing, the, the line about the trophy wife was something that I took out, I put in, I took out, I put it back in. Mostly because I was like just thinking about being in that room with Jackie, hearing that line, and I ended up leaving it in because I felt it was really important. And Jackie is like a very strong person. You've seen in the movie, she's a total survivor, and I don't think, in a way, that really surprised her. I think she was more thinking about, you know, what are people going to think about timeshare business or you know the poop in my house kind of thing than than the relationship stuff. Um, but um, but probably some of that you know will kind of kind of settle in too. I think that you see that in the Christmas party at the end of the Christmas party, he says it's having an effect on our relationship, the stress, and she says it's bringing us closer. And there's this kind of he said she said, and she really felt like the stress was bringing them closer, and that now he could see that she wasn't there for the money. That now he knows their love is real. And she said that a couple times. So I think, you know, they just had really different perceptions. Right. I have a question. Um, I thought about this a lot when I saw Christian's film and, and Jason and Liz's film also, that I was really, um, I was uh, impressed by the strength of the female characters that we, that we see in each of your films. And I'm curious about how, as filmmakers, how aware you are of those things when you're editing, when you're shooting, um, is it something that, that is a conscious, very, a very conscious process? Is it something that um, is sort of secondary to bigger things that you're looking at? Could Christian and Jason, could you guys both talk about that for, for a moment? Um, I, I mean, first of all, I think it was it was really helpful uh, making a movie with with Liz, my my girlfriend. Uh, I mean, it was just us making this, and and like her. Um, I guess like her point of view on how we wanted to um, portray Sky and portray Kristen and um, and really like I, I don't think we'd have a movie without Sky. Like I feel like she kind of stole everything. Like the boys don't really, I don't know if it, it's just the age, but like they, they really didn't want to talk about too many personal things. And um, I mean Sky, she, she opens up about, uh, like in our movie, she um, uh, she thought her mom was dead like her whole life, and then her mom friended her on Facebook, and after like 16 years, and so like she got this friend request from her mom, and I guess like her grandparents knew about it, and like didn't want to tell her. I I don't know how they wanted to handle it, but like she she told us that, and she she didn't want to meet her mom, and she like she she just. Uh, uh, let me see. It, she she just thought it was really inappropriate, and then also she was like losing her house, like she lived with her grandparents, and so they were losing her their house, and like she would share that with us, and I mean, yeah, like I, like really like we we were so lucky I think to to meet her because 
like I I don't think at all we'd we'd have a movie and she shared so much with us and uh, yeah I'm just yeah I'm really grateful that she did that so um uh, our, our characters kind of sh shifted places uh, during the film um in the beginning the, the the female character is a little chubby uh, Russian girl from from Moscow who's uh, like starstruck and and he's very arrogant and has a very polished surface and, and uh, and uh, throughout the film, actually, when she leaves him, they, 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 they change places where he totally opens up. He calls us and wants us to film because he's a prof the life of a prof professional dancer is quite uh, lonely. So he, I think he got accustomed of, of us to be there. And when he's really unhappy and, and lonely, he calls us. And she turns actually quite, um, quite uh, distanced. And... Um, and, and, and not before that, we, we found out that, that we have a very uh, uh, a strong uh, development in, in the female character. But she was, she was a girl who actually, she was the one who, who let us be there. In the beginning, he was quite irritated of us filming, and, and she was like, oh, I'm, now I'm, I can get into fame and stuff like that, I think. So, yeah, she was, she was very important for us. I think she had big dreams and wanted to get out of this small town and she realized that her beauty was a better ticket than her engineering degree. And she saw kind of her engineer, she lived in a town where it was a company town with IBM and so she kind of saw people in her world work their way up that ladder and she was like, that's not what I want and she knew that she had this power that she could use. Do we have any, any more questions? Maybe can I ask Lauren a question? Yeah. Yes, yes, please do. Uh, I was just in the in the end of the film. You could kind of feel that that she was she has got grown so accustomed to you being there. But he was a little. He wanted you out of the house somehow, didn't he? But but why was that? Do you think? I think that you know in the beginning the film was about him building the biggest house in America, and I think that um, you know I filmed over a three year period. We never really talked about when it would end. Um, I think you know they would have been fine for me to continue for a much longer period, but at that moment, things were not going his way. And I think that he, I think that he always thought, and in a way, I th I kind of thought this too, that he would kind of um, win in the end because he has done that many times before. And in a way, he played this game of chicken with the Vegas Tower where he could have lost everything because he felt like he could make that gamble and win. And in the end, when he lost possession of Vegas, that was just a really hard pill to swallow. And after that happened, um, I was finishing the film and I went at about Thanksgiving, mostly for just some pickups and to get some photographs. But it was the first time he declined an interview. And I think it was just like his, his son and Jackie said he was in mourning. Mm. That at that point, like losing Vegas, it was, you know, he just didn't want to open up. So the, the, the falling from grace wasn't really, the, how, how the public would perceive him wasn't really why he want, wanted, he didn't want to film it. I think he was, he was very open about the struggle, you know, he was very open about what they were dealing with and I think he felt very victimized in a way, as he really was by, it was kind of like a, uh, um, I don't want to say he got tricked, but he was part of the same cycle with the banks where they kind of gave him all this money for building, ba knowing that his revenue was these sales and then they said you can't make sales anymore. So they really did want to foreclose on the building and um, he had $400 million of equity in it that he lost. So um, I think that he, I think he was, I think he was also just really focused on saving his business and not really focused on the film. And then once he lost Vegas, then it was more like, okay, I'm gonna start over. Part of starting over is we're doing fine now. 
and so it was the first time that you know being really candid about where he was wasn't very appealing. Mm -hmm. I think it was it was he kind of just he didn't want to talk about it with Jackie. He didn't want to talk about it with anybody. It was just like, and there, I think there was kind of a relief too. Like okay, now we can kind of go back to normal. Um, so the, the the private life has kind of stabilized now because it seemed like he almost caved him in and leaving her in a way. Yeah, I mean, they're still together. I don't think their relationship is at any risk. And one interesting thing when I came for that last trip um, was that after they lost possession of Vegas, he cleaned up his whole home office. Okay. Like, there was not a paper on the floor. It was like, and he had like, it was, I mean, I would have loved to, you know, have, have filmed, and if I was still continuing, I would have filmed, but he was bouncing his twin on his lap, and he was like, you know, okay. he, it was like, okay, well, I, now that I'm, I'm just going to kind of start over here, and so I think there was a kind of relief there. Okay. Do we have any, any, uh, thanks. Um, Jackie, you're so the, or, well, sorry. Um, <laughs> Uh, Jackie's daughters, the, her niece and then her daughter, the niece talks a lot about coming into this money you know, from nothing and living with all this. And then her daughter, well, the daughter tends to shift focus a little bit. What do you think your future is in living in this environment of having that kind of reality fantasy? The, the girl growing up in the fantasy of everything in reality and I mean, one of the things that's really, I, I photographed a lot of um, rich kids, and one of the things that really struck me about those kids is they're not like rich kids. They're like country kids. I mean, they're like, they have all these animals, and they like grab grasshoppers, and the way she raises them, I mean, in a way she is like the manic pixie girl because she's so natural, and like their rooms are messy, and they really, um, they kind of live in a house without rules too, but, um, and they are used to a lot, but they're not spoiled in the sense that we typically think of spoiled children. And like Victoria would prefer to live in a small house. I mean, I none of them cared about this big house, even though, you know, there was ostensibly all this stuff for them, the bowling alley and the pools and the, but none of them cared at all that they weren't moving in. So I was, you know, I don't know is the short answer, but I was like really amazed on that last trip when Victoria kind of stands up to her dad in that way and has this kind of actualized moment. And, you know, I thought, you know, wow, well, she really has Jackie's strength, but in, in this new generation. And Jonquil, I have no idea. I mean, Jonquil has had a very complicated background her mother passed away and she lived in poverty and then she came to this house and um, you know I, I think she definitely has a sense of reality like she knows that her life is not going to be like this when she grows up one thing that I found kind of striking is uh, I think more than once um, I think Jackie jokes like, oh, you said you were going to trade me in for two 20-year-olds uh, when I turned 40. Um, on what level do you think that kind of uh, manifests like genuine anxiety? And on what level do you think that's kind of a bit of a riff on their own relationship because she's so much younger uh, than he is? Well, I think it kind of reflects, you know, what she knows about their relationship was that she was young and a beauty queen and that was part of the attraction. I mean, he says, you know, he always loved Miss America. Right, and right. she was that person. And so I think that for any, um, you know, woman whose value comes so strongly from their beauty and their physical appearance, the aging process is really challenging. And um, so that's, you know, why I included the, the scene where she's getting Botox and and collagen, but I think Jackie is also, um, she can joke about it and right, she can right. kind of. She has a sense of humor about it. Right, and it's interesting because again, you kind of can't really see sort of a, a, a cultural figure in our society who kind of hues more to sort of these conventional notions of female beauty can, you know, the submissiveness than Miss America. And the fact that he is so obsessed with it, uh, yeah, I think is kind of compelling. So we. Any, any more questions? And I think that's why she's kind of 
in a way, not that sad when she says, I like my husband being humble because right, when right. he doesn't have money, he's not as much able to, you know, have like 30 Miss America girls at his beck and call anymore. Right, he's like, right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, it's a very compelling moment, the whole, the whole concept of humbling. Uh, and it, yeah, I feel like that was kind of maybe a culture wide uh, sort of thing. It wasn't just specific uh, to him. And I think, I think it's one of the things gives the, the film such resonance. You know, is that even though obviously that's a very, very uh, extreme uh, case, I feel like it's something that people can relate to. Let's be, uh, any more questions or, or can we? Okay. Well, thank you uh, very much uh, for a great <laughs>